Good morning. How are you? Um, I guess happy Friday, right? That's a, a good way to start. Um, I'm Leah Sims. I'm here, a, a program officer on the green team with Enterprise. And I'm just going to give a quick introduction to our um, resiliency speakers for the day. Um, for anybody who's not familiar, Enterprise, um, our mission is to create opportunity for affordable housing and um, ensure that moderate and low income people have, have thriving and diverse communities within which to live. And we've been doing this for around 30 years. Um, at the devastation of Sandy, we really got involved with the resiliency movement and um, it was a stark reminder of the importance of having a safe place to call home for everybody. And Enterprise is committed to ensuring that the New York region's affordable housing infrastructure has the resilience necessary to provide that shelter and services to the low and moderate income demographic. Um, some of our goals here are building on our history and experience in rebuilding nearly 10,000 homes on the Gulf Coast following Hurricane Katrina. And we responded to Hurricane Sandy with thoughtful recovery effort that bridges immediate response and long-term resilience. Some other things were ensuring adequate public and private resources to rebuild effectively and efficiently in Sandy-affected communities, and especially those in that low and moderate income demographic that is really our primary focus here at Enterprise. We are supporting the sustainable, resilient redevelopment of existing affordable housing in vulnerable areas and support community-based organizations in developing disaster preparedness resources. Um, so as a background to our speaker uh, series that is focused around resiliency, we initiated the Resiliency Speaker Series as a three-year training series to support recovery and strengthen the long-term resilience of affordable housing for most vulnerable residents. And the series has featured 45 technical experts on topics ranging from emergency repairs to resident engagement. And to date, we um, staff more than 325 organizations and agencies that have received some type of training. Um, today, our speakers are Bob Shepard and Mike Esposito from Atelier 10. And I'll just give you a quick background on them before, before they take it over. So Ben is the associate director at Atelier 10's New York office and has been involved in resilient design on a variety of scales from urban scale planning to envelope and building design. And he co-manages the New York office in New York City and has consulted for a wide range of projects and various clients. He's a lead AP and he teaches graduate level sustainability courses at Cornell University in the architecture art and planning program and he's also teaching at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Mike is an environmental designer at Atelier 10, and he supports a large range of projects from environmental design, energy analysis, daylight, and benchmarking work. He brings an analytical perspective to the firm and utilizes this in the development of in-house analysis tools, as well as investigating the latest green technologies. Mike has expertise in building envelope analysis and facade optimization, which um, this tool is really focusing on today. So um, with that, I will turn the floor over to you, gentlemen. Great. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming, first off. Um, I, uh, just to give you a quick rundown of what we'll go through this morning, um, I'll give a short introduction, uh, kind of set the stage, um, and then Mike will take over, um, tell us more detail about the tool that we've developed um, in partnership here with Enterprise, and then actually open up the tool and run, it through, run you all through it because um, that's the, the best way to do introductions is to really dig in deep and uh, uh, get involved. Um, first, a, a little bit about Atelier 10. Um, Mike and I are both based here in the New York office. Uh, we actually started in London in 2001 uh, as a group of progressive engineers. Uh, we're consulting environmental designers and uh, lighting designers 
Uh, while many of us come from architecture and engineering backgrounds, uh, we don't do full service architecture or engineering. Uh, we stay really on the consulting side, but firmly focused on the built environment uh, from large scale projects like master plans, um, multi-building projects to uh, institutional, commercial office, multifamily, um, increasingly resiliency projects too. Th these are a few you see on the screen now. Uh, in the middle is the Far Rockaway competition uh, we did with the Lab last year. Um, did not uh, win, unfortunately, but uh, was a great exploration in terms of um, uh, both site design and building design and thinking about resiliency um, for the Rockaways. And um, of, of course, uh, post Sandy, uh, many of these issues have come to the fold um, in a number of ways we think uh, about uh, environmental design or sustainability, green design is really high quality design and I think resiliency is a natural exploration of that effort too. Uh, and we really um, attach ourselves to projects throughout the design phases um, through consulting efforts, looking at daylight within buildings, um, full building energy analysis, uh, benchmarking services with things like the LEED uh, system, uh, for green building rating system, other green building rating systems which have now developed internationally. Um, but now more so than just the design phase, even through the construction phase and focused on things like verification, how are buildings actually performing? Uh, are they using as much energy as we in, uh, thought they would be during the design phase? If not, why is that different? Is that because of building occupants? Is that because of uh, changes to the climate and the annual average temperatures? Can be a variety of reasons to that. And so working with uh, teams, we can really go back and, and explore um, the reasons of why we've ended up where we are. Um, of course, here in New York, uh, this was Lower Manhattan, where we're at today um, during Sandy. Uh, Sandy had a big impact uh, probably on many of us in the room. Our own offices on 20th Street, uh, just north of Union Square. Uh, we were without power for a week, um, working from homes, uh, making sure that uh, people, our, our employees, our families were safe. Um, we were not impacted uh, certainly as severely as many folks out on the Rockaways, the Jersey Shore, um, other areas of Manhattan, but I would characterize this as a, a certainly a big wake-up call. And in the aftermath, uh, really the design construction community within New York City and the region um, has really come together and uh, focused on these issues from a wide variety of policy, uh, design, uh, and even, even the building trades. Um, and while Sandy was certainly bad, uh, uh, lives were lost, homes were lost, it could have been worse in a way. Um, uh, this is uh, from the fantastic film, The Day After Tomorrow. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But uh, again, it, it could have been worse. Uh, it did get colder later on uh, during the, the end of that uh, week post Sandy, uh, but it wasn't this. It wasn't uh, frigid temperatures, uh, it wasn't snowfall. Um, and that's an important impact of when these uh, uh, natural events, disasters, et cetera, being accelerated now through human impacts of climate change are happening. Um, and again, um, we start to see these events over the past 20 years um, increasing. Uh, it's not just uh, major storms, but also other events, flooding, um, uh, lots of other things going on in within um, uh, our fabric of transportation, of infrastructure, um, everything else within the urban environment that so many of us live in and so many of us uh, increasing population lives in, uh, these could be huge impacts. Um, a lot of our work builds off of the Building Resi Resiliency Task Force. Uh, this was an effort um, really championed from the Urban Green Council here in New York. Uh, which is the local uh, chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council. Um, they brought together um, around 300 people. We were involved uh, for the uh, about six months post Sandy to really think about what does resiliency mean for a city like New York with all of the existing buildings we have, infrastructure issues. Um, how should we be thinking about resiliency moving forward in terms of codes? Uh, in terms of regulatory changes, but also recommendations for developments, uh, wide ranging from commercial office buildings to multifamily residential. Um, in a way, everything we have um, in, in the city. Um, again, lots of, of, of great uh, design professionals uh, within the industry were involved in this, um, and a lot of the recommendations came through uh, different strategies, different technologies, um, hard and soft solutions, um, and, and that's kind of where our effort uh, that we'll be talking about today comes out of. Um, I, I would also say that while many of these are technical solutions, a lot of these are also need to be 
in, in the wider vein of resiliency, social solutions. Um, it, it really is about communication. Um, it's about in neighborhoods knowing um, you know, who your neighbors are and, and uh, protecting resiliency can be a very much a social issue too, uh, but we'll focus really on the technical side today um, in this overview. Um, and so one of our uh, research aspects from the Building uh, Resiliency Task Force report was really focused on passive survivability. How long can you uh, potentially stay uh, within a building depending on the condition of the facade, depending on how much insulation is in there, the quality of the glazing and the windows, um, how many days are you able to survive in that building without power? Um, and we can't have backup power solutions necessarily for every project, every building. Um, hospitals, other critical care facilities focus much more on, on those aspects because they need to continue running. Um, but when we don't have power to multifamily residential, um, what do we do? And our thinking about this really is, is in terms of big R, big resiliency, and also little r resiliency. Big R resiliency being when the storm event happens, when the disaster happens, uh, how do you respond? Little r also being the same technologies, uh, how do those respond on a daily basis? How can a better building envelope not only uh, give you a few more days of passive survivability during a storm event, um, but also improve um, annual average energy bills, uh, thermal comfort within the built environment. Um, there can be a lot of, of win-wins or multi-benefits for both. So, <clears throat> so without mechanical heating and cooling, um, the building envelope is really our only line of protection, um, so including the windows, walls, and roof. Um, in Urban Green's Baby It's Cold Inside report, they likened the building envelope to an article of clothing, saying that if New York City buildings wore clothing, the typical building would have on a light jacket, not warm enough to wear outside in the winter and not insulated enough to maintain habitable apartment temperatures during an extreme weather event without power. So we ask, what extreme weather event should we design for? Um, and this includes new design and retrofitting. And you know, how puffy should our jackets, or how puffy do our jackets need to be to maintain habitable temperatures you know, during a power power outage? So this question of uh, habitability and thresholds is is a big kind of initial question. And while um, ASHRAE thermal comfort is relatively re well defined at this point, um, those extremes of habitability are are still being investigated. Um, Post-Sandy, post uh, the Resilient Design Institute and the Building Resiliency Task Force identified um, 50 degrees as a reasonable lower threshold, uh, maybe a conservative lower threshold for habitability, and 90 degrees Fahrenheit as an upper threshold. And it's important to note that these, um, you know, beyond these temperatures, it, it's really about extended exposure beyond these temperatures. Um, and observations that exposure, extended exposure beyond these temperatures has increases the likeliness of um, thermal disorders such as um, heat disorder or hypothermia. So to the point about extended exposure, um, when analyzing, when setting up an, the analysis of passive survivability, we're not so much worried about that one uh, record day in the summer when, when temperatures got up to 110 degrees. Uh, we're more concerned about a series of very cold or very hot days um, that where, where the heat or the, the cold didn't let up and didn't provide any relief and the apartments just continue to accumulate heat or, or cold. And so for each of the cities that we've analyzed, we um, we looked through, we combed through 20 years worth of weather data and pulled out um, what we found to be extended periods um, of hot or cold uh, for each of those climates. So this gray line on the graph, um, this is for New York City and this is uh, summer of 2013 when we had six consecutive days above 90. Now 90 degrees isn't um, unheard of temperature in New York, but six consecutive days um, is considered to be. Um, oh, laser pointer. Yeah, that's helpful. On the screen. Uh, okay. Sorry, which one? 
Yep. You got it. Yeah, so this gray line here is the summer of 2013 from July, or, yeah, July 14th um, and out. Um, I should also note that this red line here, this is um, an energy simulation or predicted inside air temperature. So this is the predicted response to that outside condition without any mechanical heating or cooling. So this is how you would expect that temperature to fluctuate, um, assuming that occupants open and close the windows um, when it makes sense. So when it's cool out, cooler than inside, they'll open the windows. So Mike, it trends very much with the outdoor temperature, but over time is continually rising too because of the amount of heat buildup in the, in the unit? Right. Yeah. So we're finding that in winter, it's a, it's a similar trend. Um, this one, this one is a kind of direct relationship to how much heat is leaving your envelope. So improving the insulation and reducing the amount of air leakage in the form of infiltration or exfiltration from the envelope improves, uh, extends the period when, during which your inside air temperature stays above 50. So, keep pressing the wrong button, sorry. So this blue line, this gray line is the outside air temperature. Um, you can see it stays around, this is for New York City again, it stays around 10 degrees Fahrenheit for about a seven day period. And the blue line is the inside air temperature uh, for a particular envelope. Um, this blue indicates that this period has, or the temperature has dropped below 50 degrees. So from here on out, pretty much um, occupants are exposed to that 50 degree temperature or less. So this, this gets to, uh, you know, now to talk about how puffy that jacket needs to be. Um, really what we're talking about um, for envelope performance, the, the parameters that matter most to extending passive survivability are the amount of glazing, the air tightness of the facade, and the insulative properties of the, of the envelope. So that includes the wall R value and the glass type. Um, this tool that we've been working on with Enterprise provides the flexibility that allows you to adjust these parameters independently or collectively and understand the relative impact of those design decisions or those retrofit decisions on extending the passive survivability or the, the time that the, the apartment stays above or within an acceptable range. Uh, this is kind of a screenshot of the tool I'll open up in a second. Um, but one way to use it is, is uh, you can see that the, the, there's four boxes here, and the tool allows you to evaluate four different scenarios, and each scenario is, is a different configuration of, of envelope variables. So you can see they're all fixed at a window-to-wall ratio on the top of 25%. Um, but in, in this case, we have our worst scenario for air tightness um, in the least insulation, which corresponds to the, the quickest uh, rate of heat loss within the apartment. But as we start to tighten up the building envelope, um, seal, seal cracks in the walls and windows, um, increase the insulation layers, and improve the glazing from single to double and so on, we see that the rate that you lose heat to the, the outdoors decreases and extends that period of time which you can expect to stay above 50 degrees. So that's about a 30 degree difference between the best and the worst scenario. And in the best scenario, you only go down to 60 degrees for the, the first few days and then towards the 50. But in the worst, you're really at, you're at 20, right. 20 degrees. That's a massive difference between, between the two. Yep. Yeah, question. Of, of the uh, four factors that you kind of took into account here, did you see one that stood out as being more impactful mm. than yeah. others? Great question. Um, it, it kind of leads on to this. Uh, this is the same um, same climate. Uh, it's an apartment in New York. Here we've isolated, uh, we've kept these parameters fixed, the 25% window to wall ratio, the R value, and the glazing type, but we're just adjusting the air tightness. And we found in many different climates, you know, adjusting or air tightness has a very large impact on on passive survivability. 
this is one of the key ones. And then <coughs> beyond that, um, glass, the performance of the glass in, in the wall insulation is really important for the winter. In the summer, there's also a range of performance possible. Um, you can see in, in a case with um, mainly in, in the summer, it comes down to you know, how much solar heat gain you're getting into the space. So any effort, design effort, to minimize the, the solar gains to the space um, while operating windows at nighttime um, really allows you to, to kind of stabilize and stay below the peak outside air temperature, which is this gray line. Um, in the worst case, with a single glazed uh, facade facing south, all these summer cases face south, um, you really, your peak temperature is matching or exceeding the outside air peak temperature. Um, so minimizing those gains um, and kind of shading the exposed, any exposed thermal mass uh, of the wall allows you to stabilize and, and slowly gain. You know, you're not, yeah. Um, and I think another nice aspect of the tool is uh, this element down here, which just allows you to um, overlay uh, the periods, identify the periods when your inside air temperature exceeds that 90 degree threshold, Fahrenheit threshold. So what we're looking at is um, we're trying to uh, select design variables, um, make improvements that minimize both the duration and the amount of time that this area is shaded. Uh, so at this point, um, and these, um, the results of this tool you'll find um, are match very closely generally um, to some of the earlier research for babies cold inside. Um, in, in summarizing, kind of in the winter, you uh, air infiltration, uh, reducing air leakage through the facade and insulating the facade is very critical. In the summer, it's about um, shading the windows or selecting um, a, an appropriate glass with the right solar heat gain coefficient to, to minimize those solar gains. All right, so the fun part um, is actually opening up the tool. Um, give me one second to switch over. Um, I think you go to you hit uh, F8 again and go to duplicate. Yeah. Just one yeah. Okay. So give it a hold on. Oh. Takes. There we go. You're up. Okay. So this is the interface you saw in the presentation. Um, you start kind of at the top here uh, and set your location and your season. The location, what it does is it, it picks the weather file. Um, so we have New York, Boston, Washington, DC. Um, when you select the season, uh, this is selecting that extreme hot or cold week from that weather file for that given location. Uh, what it's also doing is uh, it's determining, uh, for the summer case, we're using a, a southwest facing apartment as a, a kind of worst case scenario. Um, where you're exposed to those solar gains. In the winter, uh, we're using a northeast facing apartment with very little solar gain. So we're really relying on the insulative property of the envelope to minimize heat loss, and, and we can't rely on solar gains. Um, the seasonal thresholds, uh, these are set at 50 and 90, but can be adjusted. Um, and then down here, you'll see the graph output. Right now, I'm showing uh, all four scenarios, um, but you can isolate them by clicking these boxes here. So if we look at only option one, um, uh, we can see that this one has 25% window to wall ratio, um, very poor air tightness, and clicking the box kind of reveals more of the details about what that means in terms of air changes per hour. Um, this is a, a leaky building um, <laughs> with kind of cracks in the, in the walls and the, in the window framing. Um, 
increasing the air tightness corresponds to different kind of envelope upgrades. Uh, pour loosely corresponds to air sealing, um, using some kind of caulk around windows to seal gaps. Um, the medium one corresponds to a continuous air barrier, which is um, kind of the new building standard, new construction building standard. And then good uh, corresponds to 2012 IECC building construction standards and is a very airtight building. Um, the wall R value, uh, the lowest value here is, is three, and this corresponds to a masonry construction, so no insulation, just four inches of brick, uh, air gap, and then a backup CMU, um, or kind of multiple layers of brick. Uh, the glass type goes from single to double to double low E uh, to low E with argon fill. Um, so with the worst case options here, um, overlaying the temperature threshold shows us that really uh, it's only a matter of hours before we drop below that 50 degree threshold um, in the worst case scenario. <coughs> and I don't think this is uh, unreasonable. You see a lot of these buildings uh, around the city. Um, so um, if we start to, you know, within this, uh, increase the air tightness, uh, let's go up to medium. Immediately you see some. You see this extend slightly, but in combination with slight upgrades to the insulation level, so going from R3 to R8, which is equivalent to one inch of exterior insulation, roughly, um, and increasing the insulation of the glass, you start to see that period extend. So instead of a couple hours, we're looking at uh, a day and a half in this case. Um, another way to use the tool yeah, put this back is to keep this maybe this is the kind of current condition um, we're looking at a high-rise residential building uninsulated in New York and then turn on the option two and use this to really look at what what benefit do I get um, over the baseline case with increasing the air tightness the R value to R13, two inches of insulation, and increasing the glass type, or improving the glass type. So, so by going to the extreme, as Ben pointed out, we're seeing that that temperature, you know, by minimizing losses through the envelope, air and conductive losses, um, you know, really you can stay above 50, you know, throughout that seven day period potentially. If we switch over to uh, a summer situation, um, here you'll see that actually increasing, let me, let me turn, turn these graphs off again. So this is our, our worst case again. Um, and actually it gets worse um, because as soon as you increase the window to wall ratio, you're adding more solar gains to the space. So. We've assumed almost a modest level of glazing, 35%. Uh, You've seen some of the newer high-rise construction go much higher than that, and you can imagine the issue that's associated with that um, if it's not um, well shaded or um, has the appropriate solar heat gain coefficient. But um, really, air tightness it comes less into play in the summer um, because we're assuming that the occupant is smart enough to open the windows at the at the right amount of time, and this this trumps kind of air tightness concerns. Some, some air getting, allowing your building to, or your apartment to lose heat to the outdoors at night is beneficial to the performance. Um, there's a benefit, some benefit to increasing the insulation, uh, but the greatest benefit comes through the windows and you can see, you'll see that this, this will start to drop rapidly. Um, or you'll be able to shave off that kind of peak inside air temperature. So these are, um, yeah, this, this tool is, I think, is most useful um, due to the kind of flexibility of it. It's meant to be um, a tool to, to really take out into the field and, and assess when, you, when you're evaluating um, different envelope upgrades or new building construction. Um, it's another layer onto that energy efficiency story. Um, it's another layer to add to your kind of architectural intent for the project and 
and your other considerations. And, and I think the hope with this tool, too, is that it can become not only a policy um, kind of recommendation piece to say, hey, um, increasing building codes or um, levels of insulation or improvements there have these benefits. Um, we go from uh, hours to 24 hours to 72 hours of passive su survivability. Um, I think in the field, too, it's also a conversation really between the designers, the architects, and the contractors on site because so much of air tightness, which is the critical element we've identified uh, in the winter situation, is really that conversation about constructability and how that wall and envelope is built. Um, you could have great glass in that if there's a lot of thermal bridging, there's a lot of uh, a lack of air tightness, a lot of gaps between the facade. Um, that's going to pull down the best glass in the world. Um, so really, again, having these conversations or, or having a tool like this to inform to say, um, What's the benefit? What's the value of being able to passively survive, comfortably survive in, in a building going from 24 hours now to 72 hours or approaching a week? Um, what's the value to that? And again, try to change some of the life cycle cost, uh, first cost um, conversation. Um, do you want to show again uh, the tool too? I think um, a lot of this is very easy to use. Hopefully you're seeing. Um, but a lot of the uh, instructions and key details and things are also in here. There are some buttons in the upper right, uh, the question mark buttons too go into the details. So if there are questions about what is a poor facade or what's um, very good air tightness, um, you could see the, the definitions for what's used there along with the description of, of what aspects or factors we're really talking about. Uh, so I think rather than just being a complete black box in a way, like a lot of simulation tools are these days, um, this uh, tries to put everything out there up front because really it's an educational um, tool for all of us involved in the, in the design construction industry. Yeah, so most of, most of the high level questions can be answered through um, these pop-up boxes here and more of the detailed assumptions um, and background information as well as additional resources um, can be found on, on one of the other tabs. So with that, um, given the, the overview of things, uh, we're happy to open it up for questions, um, both on uh, the methodology or uh, what's in, what's not, um, other, other factors too involved in, in this conversation. Um, so what, what questions are out there? Yeah, please. How can you choose, um, I guess, the thresholds or you know, in terms of the data that you chose and the cities that you selected? Obviously, you, started, you, you had a starting point. Yeah. Um, like you know, how much, how many years did you go back? Um, you know, how did you, how did you come to that decision? I guess, and is it easy to modify if you needed to modify that going forward for other cities or for? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's not too difficult. We wanted to pull data from recent past so that this wasn't some anomaly of the past. It was something that's happened recently and, and could happen, you know, this year. Um, so we looked at twenty years worth of data and compared both the the hottest day of record to um, the longest kind of extended heat wave or cold spell. Um, it's fairly easy to modify, but it is a little manual um, at the moment. But um, I think this process, uh, this way of evaluating passive survivability is gaining traction and, um, you know, could, that could be um, streamlined or compiled for kind of other people to use in a way. Yeah, and the focus with, on the cities um, was definitely on the East Coast first, mm -hmm. um, but also cities where there was a, a definitive winter and summer period. Um, so uh, interestingly, I mean, D.C. starts to add in then the humidity in the summertime. Um, that becomes the big thermal comfort driver um, along with the heat, but it's really the humidity there. Um, and um, so the idea was that we would have a, um, if we were just looking at, say, Phoenix, winter, wouldn't really tell us much um, or, or be that useful. Um, so we were looking for cities that really have, have both, both seasonal aspects. Other questions? Yes? Can you talk a little bit more about um, your, who the intended audience is for this? Is this more like an existing building tool or a new construction? And like, how do you expect people to, to use this? It seems like a really, really great tool. Great. Thank you. Um, you want to answer? Yeah. Um, I think um, I think it's I think it's useful for both. Um, 
I, I think it's um, mainly catered towards existing buildings and, and kind of maybe some of the sore thumbs of the, of the city, these projects that we know um, are going to have an issue. Um, and it, it's supposed to be a useful tool for those projects to um, you know, assess different envelope upgrades so it doesn't make more sense to add an inch of insulation or improve, uh, replace the glass. Um, so this is set up uh, mostly for those existing buildings. You can see the baseline assumptions um, are, you know, go down to like single glaze. You know, more of those typical on um, kind of the older projects or older buildings of the yeah. city, or or certainly the the biggest piece of existing stock in the city, uh, the the large, tall, uh, high rise. Um, luxury towers in Midtown get a lot of the focus, certainly, and attention in the news. They're huge, they're big, um, they're well-funded. Um, meanwhile, the majority of residents, and certainly the biggest impact that that's going to have, um, is on this existing building stock as identified. So that was one of the reasons, too, we didn't choose a much higher window-wall ratio. Um, we're really thinking that this is a tool for existing buildings and making those upgrade or, or retrofit decisions. Um, hopefully starting to pull it more towards having better envelope. Um, other questions? Or comments, too. We'd love to make this a discussion, too. So, um, is, Will this tool allow you to, um, I see you have, you have the graph function, but the, will it pull out like a table or any like charts um, to look at so you can do comparisons uh, more detailed? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, you can do pretty much anything you can do in Excel with this. So. Um, print. Yeah. Uh, no, there's um, there's kind of uh, more practical restrictions, um, locks that prevent you from editing fields that you don't mean to edit, kind of. Okay. But um, you can print from here, and you can also uh, you should be able to grab, copy and paste into uh, like Illustrator or another program like that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in the back row. Yeah. How does um, what's the next step in getting? this data and these different options into actual uh, design measures in uh, retrofitting this housing stock. So where do you combine, um, if we're going up air tightness and insulation, what techniques do you work on that, like to, to check out what techniques fit which uh, uh, improvements? What's the next step in that? So the question in a way is how do you achieve Verify, a good level yeah. or or um, get to that level of air tightness, uh, yeah. the strategies, or yeah, yeah, the air tightness one. Um, that one is very tricky, as you alluded to. But I think um, like there are testing procedures that are becoming more and more commonplace, or um, we're kind of trying to push to become more and more uh, commonplace, including blower door testing, which allows you to, you know, before a renovation, assess how leaky your facade is, and then tested afterwards, you can verify that, um, you know, the upgrades you've, you've, uh, you've done have improved that situation. So um, that's one way of doing it. Um, others have, have started to go through the process of doing the thermal imaging, um, which is pretty amazing to see uh, some of the newer, maybe almost passive house standard uh, buildings that were built in Brooklyn. Uh, you, you've seen an image. Um, that shows it in contrast to the adjacent buildings and, and how minimal heat loss is, is, is going through there. And then utility bills <laughs> uh, before and after. Um, but in terms of like predicting before, you're, before you've gone through those upgrades, um, this is a good tool to assess you know, before you've invested the money where to spend it or where to um, put your effort um, and then verifying along the way is very important, too. Yeah. And the cost, certainly, too, is one thing that the tool doesn't include. Um, given regional construction markets, the constant fluctuation between construction costs of projects, that's not something that's included. It's very much a qualitative tool in terms of what's the varying levels of performance. But we think that people, uh, teams can take the tool and say, well, let's price out what, um, I mean, passive house level is certainly 
a very high level of envelope efficiency and everything. Uh, we could price that out. We could have something that's, say, good in this system or our current very poor. We know, we know already what we're spending on that in terms of utility bills, um, what the sunk cost is there already. Um, so um, that's one thing that's not included in here for those reasons. Um, other questions? Okay. Yeah, please. Um, I think you're right. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking that in the private sector, it might be a very useful tool for selling to clients, especially if you tie it into cost factors. Um, but I'm wondering in the public sector, the building department for decades now has been accumulating a lot of information on buildings from alteration applications. And if you could, uh, assuming there's a city agency that actually cares about the population at large when it gets into dire straits, I wonder if this could be tied into a larger program where they could take the data of the various air tightness of buildings, assumptions maybe, but certainly the, the nature of the way the walls are and the windows are, and then call up when the weather is getting in certain areas and notice which buildings, which communities start to have uh, parts of the population in jeopardy yeah. and then get, you know, HHR or whoever, whatever city agency, get the people out there right. to start to see what could happen so that instead of having, you know, the front page of the post, oh, the city of New York failed, 25 people died of cold yesterday, yeah. you know, you actually have, no, we didn't. Yeah. We actually were dealing with it. Yeah. And I think it, I don't know if you, I mean, obviously this is in development, but uh, I would think that selling, you know, proffering this to some city agencies yeah. might be a useful uh, tool. It, great, great point, I think. I mean, I think there's a renewed interest now in data, in big data. Um, certainly that's the part of the local I-84, which is the, the building level metering and reporting to the city of how well a building's performing. Um, maybe that gets tied into Office of Emergency Management. Um, maybe you start to cherry pick the largest, say, affordable housing uh, projects, nursing homes, um, the most at risk. Um, think of think of uh, Katrina. I mean, a big issue with Katrina was there were uh, lots of issues with Katrina, um, but um, no transportation plan for a uh, population that didn't have access to vehicles. Um, so there was no plan for that. Do you start to then kind of cherry pick between uh, this is the most at-risk population, uh, an at-risk at building, like you're saying here, identify those and really stave off um, some of the biggest impacts or headlines that ultimately come from a power outage of 72 hours in a 20-degree week. Um, I, I think that could be really interesting. I think there are maybe partnerships, too, with local universities. Um, NYU's new Center for Urban Science Sustainability is doing a lot of the heat mapping uh, Mike talked about. Um, they're doing a, a new uh, um, headquarters um, uh, school building in downtown Brooklyn. Um, great outreach efforts, maybe through Columbia, other universities, Pratt, et cetera. Um, you know, ways to start to tie in this data to not only educate students, I think, um, on the importance of building envelopes and pushing for this in projects as they become designers and working in the built environment, but also policymakers. I mean, we, we do hope that um, this tool it, it really gets out and communicates, too, that there are many ways of dealing with the challenges of climate change and resiliency <coughs> that we're facing, um, again, as more and more people live in a dense urban environment. Um, that's, that's a key, key issue. Uh, other other points or questions or follow-ons too. We're happy to happy to talk about whatever. More like a comment. Uh, sure. I've been uh, dealing with the public housing authority, which is a huge, huge stock of buildings in New York City, which are uh, degrading, uh, very underfunded, and they need not only a lot of maintenance, but they need to really step up to the climate changing uh, environment and I mean something like this could be used to develop a long-term incremental hardening and optimization uh, that can be used by many agencies and sources of funding which is the biggest problem because they would like to just redo the whole facade all at once yeah. for a, and they, I mean NYCHA houses a population equal to the city of Seattle 
which is it's just mind-boggling. Yeah. So uh, a long-range vision could be developed, a, a plan to incrementally get there. Yeah. I think it's a great tool for that. Yeah. Well, thank you. No, and I think that's, it, it, we're always kind of looking for the key points of the sweet spots of where do you get the most bang for the buck or the most public benefit for the buck of, of tax dollars, et cetera. So, um, you know, certainly uh, hope that NYCHA would be interested in something like this to help push along retrofits that um, I know are upcoming in their housing stock. Uh, maybe it's also something that's a part of uh, refinancing um, existing homes, um, multifamily, et cetera. Um, even a part of the new push for affordable housing in New York City, right. um, starting to put standards on um, the, the areas. I mean, again, it's, it's about resiliency and, and passive survivability during these events um, uh, d uh, that happen more and more frequently, but it's also about um, the, the monthly utility bills. Um, it's about all that and, and changing some of the, the structures within that. So um, we think there's a lot of benefit for both um, um, survivability in, in the big events. Uh, we also think in the day-to-day, -day, um, the monthly utility bills, the monthly um, budgets, um, there's a big benefit too there. Yeah. Uh, another thing I was just going to add to that was um, seeing the information like this, for me, kind of uh, reiterated the importance of the envelope on the performance because, you know, quite often we see um, some of these, uh, like, mechanical system savings um, maybe trump the envelope upgrades or be uh, come at a or the envelope upgrades come at a higher cost than some of those uh, simple um, mechanical upgrades so you know this just adds another layer another layer of value to some of those envelope upgrades um, improving both energy efficiency and um, the passive survivability yeah that's a real key takeaway for for housing I mean uh, commercial office buildings certainly systems um, uh, start to matter a lot more in terms of energy performance, but um, in residential, especially multifamily housing, it's really envelope driven. Um, so it's an issue of comfort, but again, uh, the overall energy use is really driven by that envelope um, and how well it's performing. Um, yeah. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, please. Um, so could you, um, what was the basis for those uh, thresholds, the 50 degrees and the 90 degrees? Like, what's the um, the baseline for those? Is it a matter of like you can't survive for more than a couple of days under that temperature or could you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, great question. And, and certainly there's a lot of variables um, within that based on age of, of population, um, uh, you know, your, your, your own tolerance, level of fitness. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, different factors within that. Um, yeah, some of, these, some of these sources, I mean this, um, I think it's hard to find a subject group to go through testing for, for these thresholds, unlike thermal comfort. Um, but a lot of these sources are, one is NOAA for the heat extreme. and, and um, But the 90 degree set point really um, is a moving kind of threshold because it, it's a relationship mainly between the humidity, which high, humidity's level, high humidity levels prevent your skin from kind of losing heat to the environment. So it's a combination of humidity and air temperature. And this 90 degree threshold um, at low humidity uh, explore, uh, corresponds to it what they've labeled as an extreme caution. Um, you know, at this point, I, I think they're just uh, conservative in saying that extended exposure to these increases your risk likelihood of, of heat disorder. Um, for, the, for the cold climate, or for the cold threshold, um, there are various resources um, and situations that, that they've observed, um, kind of risk of hypothermia at certain temperatures. But, you know, this, this varies um, based on the clothing, you know, amount of clothing that someone's wearing, their metabolic activity. Um, so this, uh, this was a consensus uh, that, I, that the Resilient Design Institute and the task force kind of arrived at as a good starting point. Um, in the while they kind of go through more research into those thresholds. So the starting point is, are those ranges, but they're also adjustable. Right. So if, if you're maybe dealing with a population that has, let's say, a nursing home, less susceptibility to that, over 80 degrees is, is, a, is a big problem. You can adjust that and set that, and, and the resulting graphs will adjust with that. 
And then we can do that just to work aside. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so these these can be adjusted. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great question. Yep. And um, one other thing I'll mention is um, this is calling out these uh, whenever the just the air temperature goes above ninety um, by clicking this use heat index for summer threshold. Um, you can see that actually expands um, because now we're taking into account not only the air temperature but the high humidity levels, um, and you can see. Yeah, there's much much more time when we're concerned. Um, we have time for one more question. Any or concluding thoughts? Okay, <laughs> take it away. Um, do you have uh, were these uh, heat ratios and the things you're doing over the course of time? Are they correlated to any type of like return interval or any like recurrence interval of like the heat waves and things? Like how often these high heat events will, and extreme cold events occur um, so that you could say, like, okay, what portion of the year are we really saving um, you know, people's lives or saving lots of money on this whole issue? Um, is there, is, do you guys have any basis uh, in that manner for this? I, I can't say we've done detailed kind of statistical analysis of, of those weather files, um, but just, just in kind of manually going through these records, you know, it's all of the dates that I was pulling up, you know, are the, the first couple of weeks in July in the winter. It's, it's always, you know, um, sometime in January. Um, and it was kind of hard to pick between the last couple of years because truth be told, like, those have been the, the hottest years of the kind of um, recent history of recording. So, um, yeah. The, the National Climate Report, um, is probably a good resource for that um, mm -hmm. that steps through. A lot of that Plan NYC, too, um, has had a lot of information and background, um, as has, again, the Urban Green Building Resiliency uh, Task Force Report and some of the documentation that they have. Uh, other, other good resources out there, we mentioned earlier the Resilient Design Institute. Uh, uh, it's Alex Wilson's group. Um, it's, uh, he was uh, from the Building Green uh, side, excellent website, and they've got a lot of resources, have kind of uh, led the charge, really starting post-Katrina, but looking at on this on a wider uh, basis, um, I think uh, they're, they're doing great work as well. Um, some of those resources are actually in the tool too, um, so you can um, look up more information there. Um, here's the Urban Green website, uh, again, that talks about improving building envelopes. And of course, Enterprise too. Uh, Enterprise has information on this as well as we'll have links to this tool um, and a video too of today's uh, conversation and questions. Um, so with that, I think we'll close and uh, say thank you again very much for, for coming today, your interest, great questions. And uh, we're happy to answer any uh, other questions here afterwards. But uh, uh, thank you all again. Thanks.